co-chair of. Oh yes, hi. Yes, hi. she's co-chairing of, of the, the 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 seminar. So if I, in case I I lost my connection, she will be there. <laughs> oh sure. We're I'm delighted gonna... to have you. So thanks for joining us. I'm gonna put my headset on just because I think it's a clearer sound. So I hope I didn't make it too loud for anybody. And I'm gonna try to. I always. I don't want to put this right on my, you know, toward my mm -hmm. mouth because then you get the popping peas. <laughs> so does it sound okay? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um... Okay. So almost the time and generally the student will, will join in you know about like that time so you will see about like uh, around 40 students or so oh i understand <laughs> i'm a teacher <laughs> <laughs> i have this thing too it's like oh what can i get done before the meeting starts and you know <laughs> yeah We'll just wait one more minute and then they will start. Okay, it's, a, it's about time. Let's let's start. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to attend uh, this year this semester uh, the speaker series. And uh, uh, for 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 the committee, I'm the, the chair of uh, uh, the the speaker series uh, uh, committee. For for ours uh, is the sort of the first semester uh, first uh, first uh, uh, seminar. Uh, this semester, so welcome everyone. Uh, I know there are some new uh, for for many of uh, 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 the students. This will be also the new uh, uh, the first semester, uh, first uh, uh, seminar. So there are some uh, general things I want to just uh, let you know, and uh, you know the seminar is generally start at uh, uh, twelve fifteen and at one fifteen. So, uh, but this semester we are trying to invite, you know, uh, many speakers and to cover the relevant uh, the, the areas in our school. And this for this semester, we have nine uh, speakers and uh, some speaker will present uh, in, in Zoom. 
through Zoom or some some will uh, come in person, and we have a uh, uh, about like three or four speakers will come in person this year, and for the other times uh, you will see the the seminar will be in, in hybrid format, and uh, I I want you pay attention to the the email announcement on on the top of the email announcement you can see the format either zoom hybrid or in person so uh, when when we have the zoom meeting so there will be no uh, presentation in the uh, in the auditorium so just pay attention to that and the other thing i want to uh, uh, let you know is it, you know uh, whatever the the speaker will present in 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 uh, online or, or join us in, in person. And uh, we are happy to help you to, you know, to bridge you uh, with uh, all the uh, speakers. If you want to, you know, uh, chat offline or, or, you know, discussing some interesting uh, topics or, or just for the network, you know, we want, we can bridge you uh, with all the speakers. Uh, and uh, there are also other, uh, you know, uh, when speakers uh, come in person, maybe there's a lunch or even a dinner. You know, we can we can bridge you and and the, those speakers. And the last thing uh, I want to uh, mention is uh, for just make sure the presentation you know goes smoothly. And I wish you can you know hold your question at the end of uh, uh, the presentation. We have a Q and A session, so you can ask your questions. And for the you know presentation online, I wish you can you know turn on your camera so you can ask your question directly. Um, but if you don't want to do that, you always have the option to you know write down your uh, questions in in the uh, uh, in the in the chat box. So I can I can you know uh, either you can you know uh, present a question or I can read that question now so everyone can can hear that. Okay. So that's a uh, so that's a very basic rules. We don't have other rules, and hopefully you 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 know you enjoy uh, these uh, uh, seminars and you can learn something. Okay, uh, and today we have a uh, uh, Dr. Valerie Duffy from uh, University of Connecticut to present uh, his research on uh, on sensory. And Dr. Duffy is a professor. Uh, and the director of uh, the graduate program in health promotion science in the Department of Allied Health, uh, health Science at uh, UConn. And uh, uh, she, has, uh, she has done a lot of research in, in this area and also other uh, areas. She has you know, tons of experience you know, in, in, in the area of uh, you know, food, nutrition, and public health. And uh, uh, she also, you know, had many mentees, and uh, you know, she also got a lot of awards, uh, you know, in, in promoting health and, and also uh, in, in the mentoring, uh, you know, students. And in terms of her research, uh, her research, the current research focuses on two things. One is uh, the, the the sensory nutrition, and um, you know, her research. I I, I read. Uh, Actually, uh, at least ten paper <laughs> of her uh, public of her studies. So I know a little bit uh, the research on, on that uh, sensory side. So uh, she uh, touched upon a lot of uh, uh, you know key questions regarding to the chemosensory perceptions in relation to in, in relation to food flavor and food preference and uh, you know uh, eating behaviors. And uh, right now I just uh, learned that. She, her team start to translate those knowledge and to promote a sort of personalized, uh, you know, nutrition intervention. So that will be very cool to hear, you know, uh, those uh, research moving forward. The second part of, uh, uh, you know, her research is focusing on the uh, community-based intervention to promote health. Uh, and for example, using the, the mobile, ho uh, mobile house uh, Tools and and the social media to promote, you know, healthy eating index among the, the children's and and the adults. So, you know, without further delay, I gave the the podium to 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 you, Dr. Duffy. So you can go ahead show your slides. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ma. That was a really nice introduction, and it is such a pleasure for me to be able to talk with you today. 
I was looking back at my slides and I talked uh, or gave a seminar uh, back in 2007 at Tufts and I heard from both uh, Alice Lichtenstein and also Joanna Dwyer that they couldn't be here, but I so respect the, the research um, of your uh, school. And if you're in training here, you really will get a fine education. So thanks again for the invite. I just wanna say that I have nothing to disclose. I'm a registered dietitian in an interdisciplinary department focused on health promotion sciences. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about sensory nutrition. I, I think of it as nutrition from the neck up and I think it's key to understanding individual inter-individual response to dietary interventions. So consumers consistently report that taste is the primary driver of what they buy or what they eat. And these are data from the International Food Information Council that are collected every year on a representative sample of about a thousand adults. And you can see that taste really drives uh, consumer purchases and what is consumed. The um, sensory nutrition was recognized in the 2000, 2020, 2030 strategic plan for NIH research, including ways to tailor diet interventions for indi individuals. And I'm gonna contend as well as to support reaching at-risk children and individuals. And new out is a uh, paper from a sensory nutrition uh, conference or a, a conference on precision nutrition that included sensory nutrition. So this is a conceptual diagram pulling together a lot of research evidence that genetics, aging, and the environment influence our ability to respond to chemicals and stimuli in the food environment through, oops, through receptor density and function, like the receptors, uh, taste receptors on the tongue, the density of papilla that hold these taste receptors, how this information is carried to the brain and how the brain responds and packages it to come up with or al allow us to perceive an integrated flavor percept that's also influenced by communications between the gut and the brain. And this flavor perception and interactions influence what we like to eat, some information on satiety responses to drive what we consume and ultimately our health and our chronic disease risk. There's just expanding information too on the communication between the gut and brain to influence preferences, metabolic responses, and hunger. So I'm going to support that taste or our sensory signals are a biomarker of health by representing habitual dietary behaviors. There's large variability in sensory perception of foods and beverages, which influences what we like and ultimately uh, choose to consume on our chronic disease risk. I'm going to recommend feasible assessment of this variability for tailored nutrition education and interventions. And I'm gonna uh, support the need for a public health approach to taste and smell in national surveillance to drive this public health approach. Now, when I say the chemo senses, I'm talking about the ability for us to respond to chemicals in the environment to give us a perceptual signal. So tastants, odorants, and irritants are chemicals that stimulate specific receptors or sensory cells. And these receptors after binding, the chemical message is transduced to a nervous signal. For mechanoreception, like the creaminess of the ice cream we enjoy eating is um, too large to stimulate chemical receptors, but mechanoreceptors um, stimulate um, or respond to texture in food. Now, interestingly, without throughout the entire body are chemoreceptors that respond to taste and odors. And that is part of the regulation of homeostasis and ability to respond to chemicals in the body. And that's the emerging field that's just so exciting. So I'm gonna focus more on the perceptual responses to chemicals. So if we were together 
I would have you do this simple demonstration. So any of you can do this. I don't have stock in jelly bellies, but they're just a terrific stimuli. And so what I would do, and I, I teach a class on the forgotten senses, it's a freshman seminar, um, as I have people plug their nose like this gentleman is doing to the bottom and insert a um, jelly belly in the mouth and sense what's uh, anything you're getting with the nose plugged and then open the nose and see the difference. And what you experience if you have a good sense of smell is a vast difference between just simple sugar possibly or sweet with a nose plug and then the ability to specifically identify what you eat, the specific flavor. So really when we say taste, it's really a composite sensation flavor. So there's really no word in the English, English language to describe this composite sensation. It's true taste, which is salt, sugar, sour, bitter, and then umami, which is the savory flavor of glutamate, possibly fatty acids that combine with smell through the nostrils and through the mouth, along with texture, mouthfeel, temperature, and irritation and pungency, which is chemesthesis. So, so that's oral sensation that combines also with presentation and sounds of eating, so flavor. And the flavor is really packaged in a unique area of the brain. And this was reported by Paul Rosen way back in 1982, that there was a difference in the flavor signal if you smelled something through the nose and through the mouth. And when you smell something through the mouth, and in fact, I had um, these freshman seminar uh, students smelling Parmesan cheese through the mouth, mouth and then through the, or excuse me, through the nose and then the mouth, and how different the perceptual experience uh, is. Through the mouth, the, all of the senses combined with unique pack, packaging of the flavor message in the brain. So that then the orbital front frontal cortex. So it's an integrated flavor person. And with the jelly bean experiment too, when you have the nose plug, you could get the fructose, that's the usual sweetener of candy. But when you open the nostril, then the flavor volatiles, especially if they're matched for sweetness, like coconut, that adds to the sweetness. So sweetness isn't just perceived because of sugars, it also is perceived through sweet volatiles. And that can actually add sweetness to products without adding additional added sugars. So variation in flavor perception occurs normally with genetic variation, interacting with environmental uh, insults or aging, as well as packaging this signal centrally. And there's al alterations that can occur that alter the chemical signal binding to the receptor, the transmission, and the central processing. So I'm going to highlight some markers of normal variation and alter alterations that are feasible in uh, inter intervention studies. And if you are looking, for example, at a biologically active compound, you could measure taste and smell knowing that the receptors that respond to these chemicals could also be variable throughout the body. And if you were looking at some kind of intervention precision nutrition, you would wanna pay attention to that and uh, could be part of the variables that you were understanding. So the first point I wanna make is that it's very simple just to ask people what they perceive their sense of smell or taste is. And a standardized protocol was included in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey the first time ever from 2011 to 2014. In the NHANES, it asked participants about smell and taste problems in the past year, loss with aging, and phantom sensations. That's like a phantom taste or phantom um, smell. About 23% of adults 40 years and older reported smell alterations and 17% reported taste alteration. And I have the, um, the healthy eating index calculation here because a collaborative effort with um, that was headed up by Shristi Rawal 
um, found that self-reported olfactory dysfunction associated with diet quality. Specifically, olfactory dysfunction associated with reporting higher energy density consumed, as well as lower healthy eating indexes, especially the moderation score, which is the consumption of less healthy foods. And this uh, relationship was true when controlling for all kinds of variables that might influence energy density and um, healthy eating index. Then we were hit with COVID and a collaborative, um, very collaborative effort in the midst of pandemic found that perceived changes in the sense of smell was a top predictor of a positive COVID-19, the SARS COVID-19 um, diagnosis among individuals with respiratory problems. In general, before COVID, um, self-rated olfactory dysfunction had its, it, it has its limitations. From the NHANES and looking at this two by two table where you have self-reported smell dysfunction, self-reported normal, measured dysfunction and measured normal, you see people in discrepant groups. For example, you see people who report that they have a normal sense of smell, but they're measuring dysfunction. And in Tom Hummel's group, um, there is sometimes a functional unawareness of even a complete loss of sense of smell or no sense of smell. And that's because the sense of smell isn't routinely tested and that we have to do something about that. It could also reflect that people just aren't attuned to their senses or they just don't pay attention or maybe they were born without a sense of smell or they lost it at an early age. Conversely, there are people who measure normal, but they could have had a very acute sense of smell and they perceive it a loss or a dysfunction. And way back when I was doing my dissertation research, we actually found that older women who self-rated a problem but tested norma, nor, normosmic had the less, least healthy diets. So the next point I wanna make is that you should pay attention to smell dysfunction and um, variation in sensory nutrition occurs with olfactory dysfunction. So the sense of smell is very vulnerable to damage. The olfactory receptors sit behind the bridge of the nose, nose and they're very exposed to environmental um, conditions and viruses. And it's only a single nerve that carries that information to the brain, single cranial nerve. It's very vulnerable to damages and it associates with income and uh, disparities and health inequality. So you can suffer from olfactory dysfunction by you know, sinusitis, nasal sinus disease, reducing the transport of odors, damage to the central or sensory receptors, damage to the peripheral nerves, and as well as head trauma or inflammatory disease and even neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's and um, Parkinson's. And so these are data from 1984 by Dick Doty showing that as aging, there's an increase in risk of olfactory dysfunction, but it's not necessarily uh, a causal relationship and there's a lot of variability. Thus, you could prevent olfactory dysfunction by maintaining healthy lifestyle, having reduced income or health disparities, getting your regular flu vaccine and things like that. And people can suffer from a, a range of olfactory ability from normal sense of smell all the way down to um, anosmia and even having phantom sensations. So before the pandemic, about 12.4% of individuals had olfactory dysfunction. And these was, this was based on an odor identification task. And older adults had a great risk of being able, unable to detect warning odors. Howard Hoffman presented these data comparing taste and smell problems perceived with those with hearing and balance. And the bottom line I'm trying to make is that olfactory and taste disorders are just as prevalent as um, other these hearing and balance disorders. 
So it's really important that chemosensory dis, uh, disorders have more attention, research funding, and public health approach. Because olfactory dysfunction influences health and quality of life. And these are just a sampling of some of the studies. So measured olfactory dysfunction associated with cardio cardiometabolic measures, as well as diabetes and depression. So COVID hit, and um, these are data that suggested that the pooled prevalence of olfactory dysfunction with SARS-2 COVID was 50%. And initially, it was suspected that the COVID virus damaged the sensory neurons, but that was found not to be completely true. And in fact, it was more that it damaged the supportive cells that held the sensory neurons. And that was the cause for both olfactory dysfunction and taste dysfunction. So just to reinforce, we smell through the mouth as a primary component of food flavor that the mouth and chewing motions are so necessary to pump the receptor, the volatiles to the receptors behind the bridge of the nose to get the full flavor food. So eating too quickly, being um, distracted when you're eating, not mindful can um, cause uh, unhealthy or relate to unhealthy eating. Dry mouth and oral uh, health problems can also diminish the perception of food flavor, even if the sense of smell is normal. So there's been a lot of advances in measuring the sense of smell. So for example, one of the uh, advances is this wonderful Sintel um, technique by uh, uh, Valentina Parma, where the, the uh, odor is embedded into this gel and you open the top and it produces a really fine quality odor so that you can not only just do a odor identification, which has issues because it's cognitively, uh, it's connected with cognition, but you can then ask people to report the intensity of the odor. If you're really doing a careful nutrition study, you should pay attention to retronasal olfaction, flavor perception. So we, we've used the jelly bellies in experiment by having a people plug their nose and perceive the sweetness and then unplug and perceive the sweetness and flavor and um, work with a number of the jelly beans. Okay, so taste is very important. In fact, the evidence connecting taste with diet is even more so because taste probably reflects overall perception of flavor. And it sounds kind of funny to say that, but it's a can be a marker of overall differences in oral sensation. So the recommendation for taste is to really measure phenotype, that is measure the behavior. And there's lots of evidence to support that measuring response to bitter intensity captures diversity in overall oral sensation. And a variation of normal from individuals who live in a pastel food world to those who live in a more vibrant or neon food world. And in the end Haynes, there is a um, measure of quinine, which is um, a bitter that's in tonic water and the saltiness of sodium chloride. But if you have other tastes uh, and you can measure other tastes like uh, sweet or sour, that would be helpful too. So again, bitter is a marker of overall variation in oral sensation. And I'm not suggesting in this slide that people uh, who bitter, uh, vary in um, bitterness of, let's say, taste in, uh, see colors differently, but it, that the bitter intensity reflects differences in overall food flavor as because of the packaging in the brain and the flavor percept. So there's about 25 different uh, bitter taste receptor genes, and some are very um, polymorphic, and some are very, the receptors are narrowly tuned to um, specific compounds like propothiouracil or phenylthiocarbamine, and some are broadly tuned, meaning they're more promiscuous. They stimulate a number of bitter receptors like quinine. When you measure the intensity of bitterness, 
it is the most variable taste. And this slide just shows the variability across a number of tastants, but over in the corner is the variance is greatest, especially with the bitterness of propothiouracil, for example, where people can experience almost nothing from an unconcentrated solution to those who perceive it as very, very intense. Again, could this be a marker of difference in overall oral sensation? We think that, the, and there's lots of data to support that. As well, the phenotype captures more variability in, uh, than the genotype. And this was just showing the bitterness of probe by threshold as well as intensity and different um, allelic variation. And the, um, the phenotype really describes the variability uh, to then map onto differences in health outcomes or diet by capturing the most variability. Also, and this is just what I find so fascinating, the same variability that you see in the mouth in response to a bitter compound, for example, or if you genotyped, could be seen throughout the entire body, including in the gut. It's just that the gut receptors are not connected to a perceptual experience, but could communicate to the brain through that gut-brain access. So these extraoral bitter receptors could be very important and you could simply measure taste in the mouth and reflective of what is going on in response throughout the body. And there are papers and evidence to this effect. So in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, we measured taste on the tongue tip as well as with the whole mouth because the sense of taste is very redundant. So when I said that only one cranial nerve responded to smell, three separate cranial nerves respond to taste, seven, nine, and 10. So that by applying a bitter taste, quinine and salt to the tongue tip, as well as with the whole mouth, you got so much more information. And in the NHANES procedure, we had um, participants rate the intensity of the taste. So the taste intensity on the tongue tip can be altered with exposure to fairly common things like um, otitis media or middle ear infection, head traumas, to have variation in oral sensation that isn't necessarily noticed, like I don't notice I've got taste loss, but it can associate with differences in overall oral sensation, heightened bitterness or differences in sensation from foods and beverages, and associate with diet and weight outcomes. So I just pulled one of our recent um, uh, studies and this was the analysis of the NHANES data that looked at tongue tip bitter and salt and found differences, depression in tongue tip bitter and salt in chronic sm smokers, as well as, the, as those who are de highly dependent, the ones that have to smoke within 30 minutes of getting up. So this tongue tip bitter and salt is just waiting to be mined in multivariate models to look at differences with diet and health outcomes. And this is just one example. Now there is challenges measuring phenotype. And you have to be very careful of the instructions that you provide participants as well. And I'll talk about that in a bit, but also obesity interacts with um, taste and smell function. So that individuals who are obese could have reduced taste and smell function related to the connection between taste, gut brain access and um, immune responses and all kinds of things. Also the food environment or the environment in general influences the connection between taste markers and diet. For example, and this is Kathleen uh, Keller, I love this research. She found that the food environment can blunt the taste genetic effects on diet and health in preschoolers. 
And it could also reflect plasticity in the chemosensory systems, meaning the ability to regenerate or not. So if you were looking at a taste marker related to vegetable intake and the children didn't really have exposure because of the food environment to uh, affordable uh, vegetables, then you're not gonna see the taste genetic effects or they'll be blunted. Now, I want to uh, shout out to some wonderful work that was done uh, at Tufts University with a lot of people I'm sure you recognize, and Spain, um, Spanish researchers, looking at some really nice analyses of coming up with patterns of taste function related to a number of different tastings. So these are the kind of you know, clever research strategies that, that tap into pattern analysis to then associate with um, dietary patterns. Really love this research. So I did say something about being very, very careful about the instructions you give people when you're measuring uh, perception. Because when you say, I perceive something, that is um, unique to you because we can't really perceive what each of, each of us is experiencing. So how to standardize and use rigorous measures, especially intensity measures. So I'm gonna to have to give a shout out to my postdoc mem uh, mentor, Linda Bartoshuk, who's the you know, leading expert in taste and psychophysics. So the goal is to maximize the ability to compare ratings of intensity across individuals. And the, the scale that we use to capture that perceived intensity as well as the directions we give people are very important. So they don't have inherent, inherent meaning, like strong doesn't really have an inherent meaning. And for example, you can see this by this uh, SS Stevens, who was the uh, important figure in psychophysics. Mice may be called large or small, and so may elephants. And it's quite understandable when someone says it was a large mouse that ran up the trunk of the small elephant. So the size is attached to either a mouse or an elephant. So it really matters the directions you give to the labels. So we can envision smaller or large mice or smaller or large elephants. We wanna be able to compare relative intensities across that. So we wanna be able to see a mouse relative to an elephant, for example. We wanna be able to compare how somebody perceives a weak taste and a strong taste. So for example, let's say you were bringing people into the lab and you wanted, you were testing people who were bitter and sensitive. So, and you know, you had them taste something and you didn't give directions on the scale. So they might've like rated it like, oh yeah, it's bitter and it's intense, but you know, I don't know what the labels mean. So I'm just gonna put it here. And then you, you bring in somebody who's bitter sensitive and among all the things that they perceive with no directions on what the scale means, yeah, they, they might put it here. And it actually, it looks like the two are different, but in the wrong direction. So instead, if you tell somebody that the top of the scale is strongest sensation of any kind, and you might say like, uh, and let them come up with a description, like looking into the sun, at noon, then that might be standardized across individuals that you would actually be able to see the correct uh, uh, intensity rating between the bitter sensitive and an insensitive person. So it's very important. So the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey had standardized instructions. There was no taste testings for individuals who could not um, appropriately rank the intensity of a non-taste standard. And this was used like we used a LED uh, light, but it could also be remembered sensations. So the take home message is don't just go out and try to measure intensity, perceptual intensity, couple up with somebody who knows what they're doing. So I wanna finish up with the idea that we should be asking more about what people like and dislike in foods and beverages and possibly even activities. So way back, we found that it was actually liking of vegetables that connected taste with frequency of consumption of vegetables. So we identified people who were super tasters who reported the vegetables, kale, Brussels sprouts, 
asparagus as really bitter that blocked any natural sweetness. They also got a lot of flavor from that, which caused a, a related to uh, differences in food preference that then associated with frequency of consuming. So the liking of the vegetables and even by a survey connected taste phenotype with consumption. Then we had an unexpected result. And this was in a health risk appraisal of over 400 individuals, men. And we found that in, in that protocol, it was a liking survey of high fat foods or sweet foods, as well as a screening food frequency. And in this worksite wellness uh, appraisal, there was adiposity measured, uh, blood pressure, serum lipids, that screening uh, frequency of fat showed no association with any of these measures of um, cardiovascular risk. But fat preference showed the relationship that you would think, higher fat preference, higher adiposity. And these held true in multivariate analysis. And in fact, why was this true? That the frequency showed no association with any of the risks, but fat preference did. Well, one, it's so easy to recall what you like. It's difficult to recall, recall what you do. And people may not always disclose what they do. So you could actually find individuals who are discordant for liking and report, reported frequency of consuming. So for example, you could find people who highly like something that who reported they don't consume it at all. They're probably restrained eaters or they could be misreporting. Conversely, you could find people who don't really like something like vegetables, but they're trying to eat more vegetables to trying to be more healthy. So when you ask people what drives what they eat, they're probably referring to how much they like the taste. So really taste, liking, or liking of foods and beverages drives consumption and liking is influenced by taste as well as other things. But again, taste is a driving food consumption. So why ask food and beverage liking? Here's a list of reasons why. It correlates really nicely with sampled foods and beverages, less influenced by fasting. It reflects, we believe, and lots of evidence to show this, usual consumption of what you eat. Because over time, you eat what you like and avoid what you don't. And liking responses are independent of energy intake. It's so simple. It's really cognitively simple. Children can do it. And also people with lower literacy can do it. We have a study now with low-income families and you know, reported liking, and it correlates nicely with lots of things. So it can increase our ability to reach out to people that may not want to do a three-day food record. We also have found that we have advanced our liking-based um, surveys to be able to construct diet quality index that show beautiful psychometric properties of uh, reliability, internal reliability, construct validity, as well as criterion validity. Um, and this shows that we can come up with a, um, we tested different ways of constructing an index of diet quality with my colleague, Rand Shu, and found that if you conceptually group into, uh, foods by like vegetables, and then uh, we did pattern analysis, machine learning, we were able to um, predict metabolic uh, risk factors in young adults. And we were able to construct an evidence-based weighting of these food groups. And we need to apply the same psychophysical principles to testing food liking as intensity of taste. For example, if we only surveyed the liking of vegetables, we might find that tomatoes were a really liked vegetable. And then if we only surveyed sweets, we might find that you know, of all the sweets, maybe butterscotch pudding wasn't on the top of the sweet list. But we really want to be able to generalize this because probably butterscotch pudding would be more preferred in the general public than tomatoes. We want to generalize the top of the scale to something pleasurable or unliked that can generalize the responses so we get the correct order. So again, even the liking survey needs to be paying attention 
to intensity ratings. So we've done, we've used the liking survey with lots of collaborators at UConn and those not listed that are not at UConn. And we've been using the liking survey to assess usual consumption of foods and beverages, but not energy intake and extending to the ability to assess usual behaviors around physical activity and sedentary behaviors. So for example, for children, they do a simple online liking survey that's very feasible and acceptable, and a five-year-old can even do it. And we have a picture of a food and, and they um, use the, the, like in Qualtrics, they, they can uh, dial up or back or forth on love it to really hate it. And then from their responses, we tailor a message. So for example, if a child says they really don't like vegetables and they hit a certain criterion that we have based on all kinds of data, they get a very fun message that was developed with the help of other uh, children. Get crunching on more veggies at every meal. Try snacking on baby carrots, bell pepper strips with dip. During In the survey within the online platform, that's very feasible like it in a um, classroom setting. They then get in response to the tailored message, how much they would like to try to work on eating more vegetables. This, they get up to ta three tailored messages. The tailored messages become the basis for an intervention, like a motivational interview to help them with goal setting or provide direction for school-based or um, you know, uh, community-based work to improve dietary behaviors. Here's just some other examples of these messages. The pictures that we have matched to the child's age, stages of change, and they can be used in a school setting to reinforce school meals and physical activity. So we've used the, these in a, a clinical setting in, the, in a pediatric emergency department, which unfortunately lots of children and family get their regular health care. We've used it in a middle school. The kids could fill it out perfectly and it got great information. This is, these are data on over 500 children. And we're using it now um, with uh, college students and we just got a paper accepted on a highly acceptable liking survey and tailored message program and useful um, message program in college students. So I wanna just acknowledge that um, this careful intervention by McKay and colleagues did not find weight difference outcomes based on if the participant followed their preferred low fat or low carbohydrate diet. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying that a simple liking survey can be used to tailor nutrition, medicate, uh, nutrition messages, as well as even track preference for a healthy diet to connect with diet and even level of weight loss, as we've seen in um, a worksite wellness intervention and bariatric surgery. So I think I'm almost on time, maybe one minute over, but I wanna say that there's much opportunity to leverage sensory nutrition for understanding inter-individual inter differences in response to dietary intervention. I have suggested some feasible and valid measures of variability in sensory nutrition. I recommend collaboration with scientists in sensory nutrition to, and uh, refer to this publication that reports on an NIH workshop on sensory nutrition and disease, including expanding from not just smelling something that doesn't have relevance to food, to expand food-based probes, interdisciplinary collaborations to understand the effect even of extra oral reception and gut-brain access responses and expand, expand clinical and population research. Taste and smell related sensory nutrition needs to be part of public health goals. And this is Healthy Goals or Healthy People 202030. And the only goal, which is still experimental, is um, to increase the number of adults who seek healthcare, a healthcare provider for their disorder. But sensory nutrition is way beyond that. We really need to have more of a response. Taste and smell should not be the forgotten senses, and they need to be part of action toward promotion of healthy eating for individuals and populations. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Duffy. 
let's uh, you know since you are here probably let, let's have some virtual applause here <laughs> okay uh say some uh, applause here so yeah let, let's uh, start the, the question the q a sessions uh, uh i see some question from the chat box oh people can just ask can't they i mean we're we're a reasonable yeah. size group <laughs> right so yeah the the first question from uh alexandra she left i think uh but the question is very interesting uh, and the alexandra storm uh, oh yeah so how yeah how perceptions change over time yeah. as an individual gains and loses weight. That's what's very interesting. So yeah. I think, um, and um, I forget the researcher's name or Cornell University has done a lot of really interesting stuff that actually um, the perception of taste and smell might improve with weight loss because you know, weight loss, uh, especially among individuals with morbid obesity is a pro-inflammatory state. There's a lot of issues with um, immune function and things like that. And, you know, the less immune function you have, the more susceptible you are to taste and smell um, alterations and, and had uh, actually found some really uh, good improvements in function with weight loss, which again would support um, the ability to get the full flavor of food, food and possibly more of the satiety single signals from food sensation. That is if you slow down your eating. So that's a great question. Probably there is some improvement um, mm -hmm. with weight loss yeah. and probably weight gain too. You probably could have more susceptibility to inflammation, nasal sinus disease and things like that with uh, weight gain, excessive weight gain. Right, so so since the, the, the taste perception can change, uh, you know, over time and, uh, you know, probably at, at certain age and for, for, you know, we can have our like food habit become sort of fixed but certainly we, we change all the time. At, at what stage or what age do you think the, the you know, is a critical windows for, for a perception can, can you know, become, it's sort of fixed, but, but uh, certainly I know it, it can change uh, over well, time. That's a great question. It's always how to compare uh, young people's perception, <laughs> children's perception with older adults and have, you know, comparable methods. And so I think there's um, like Julie Manella has a really interesting test on uh, sweet preference and making it very, very simple to try to like in a forced choice, like what your preferred level is. But intensity measures are very difficult. And even if you like say, like did a threshold, like what's the point that you first start to perceive it? Those are very, very challenging to do. So that's a good question. Like when does the ability to taste fully mature? Probably, you know, during young age, but then there are, challenges to that, like uh, the preference for sweet heightens <laughs> during growth spurts, you know, so, um, yeah. and so we don't have a lot of information on that. And interestingly, too, there's been lots of work with older adults, you know, like how taste and smell change with aging. Mm -hmm. But, you know, interesting, COVID hit young adults, too. And, and we had proposed, you know, a grant, of course, you know, it's always a, <laughs> a hit or miss thing, but we really wanted to study younger adults because younger adults were experiencing taste and smell loss with COVID and how did mm -hmm. that, that respond? And also the important question, when the their taste and smell function returned, did their diet quality improve? And no one's right. really looked at that. And so that's a really good question, like when the maximal ability to taste and smell is, but it's really not just the taste and smell, but then the, the dietary response. So yeah, that that, that will be very interesting to, to know that. Yeah, Kelly, I see you have a question. You yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, Valerie, for sharing your research. It's very interesting. Um, I was just thinking when you mentioned restricted eaters and you had your your grid that showed you know people that may say they like something but but they don't really report eating it i wonder if you've done anything to kind of tease out those who don't have access or maybe can't afford those foods that they like or also people who report not liking something but maybe they've not actually tried it oh no that's a great question so let me just answer the first one so um, 
we know that asking liking is very simple, but you're right. And we care deeply about that. So we're in the midst of an analysis um, headed up by Oak Chung and it's in collaboration with Mike Puglisi at UConn where we did the NEMS P which talks about the food environment and assesses the food environment. And then looking at uh, measures of diet quality including using that simple liking based diet, diet quality measure, it's so simple. And in fact, the liking survey does just as well as the, um, the healthy eating index calculated from a frequency questionnaire. And in fact, can tease apart that. And these were low income individuals. We recruited from Willimantic, which is low income and really low access food area. And the liking survey did really well to pick up differences, but this would be a great qualitative study to first start out with the liking survey and then really talk to people. And we're trying to do this. We're re really interested in other things, but that would be a great study and very helpful because we know it's easy and we want to encourage more participation in nutrition research. You know, people are not going to participate or it's a very special person that will fill out one of those food frequency surveys. They're incredibly difficult. And in fact, anytime we use them in my lab, we always interviewed it because it was so difficult to put what people usually eat into those little frequency categories. But that would be a great study to have people fill out a, a general quantitative uh, food intake survey and then liking survey, and then pick the discrepant people and really talk to them. That would be great. Yeah, I imagine that people in environments where there's a lot of the quote unquote hyper palatable foods yes. would, you know, have some interesting responses. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. and it was interesting because I made the point that, you know, not all processed foods are bad. And I, I picked up some of the nice research that Adam Jernowski had done. And in Australia, they did some nice research. Uh, you know, Dave's bread would be considered an ultra processed food. <laughs> But it's pretty healthy. <laughs> and, it, you know, making people who are on low income feel bad when they buy some processed food, uh, you know, <laughs> you can't have it all. And in fact, there was a wonderful study done in France where they, they followed people over five years trying to get people to cook more at home. And it was only the people that cooked everything from scratch that had diet quality improvements and could maintain their weight. So I don't think we'll ever achieve people being able to, to make Dave's at home and I have no stock in Dave so <laughs> okay and uh, Lexi you have a question in the chat it's pretty long do you mind to uh, ask that question directly yeah I don't mind asking can you hear me okay yes you um, can okay um so my question is just with regards to um the gut microbiome and if we have receptors in our um gut lining and how I guess transient those are how how easily manipulated or changed those can be yeah. um, and if the uh, population of the bacteria that's in our gut would influence our our perception of taste and if that gut bacteria shifts or changes will that also alter our um, our perception of taste I mean you hear of people who you know, didn't used to like broccoli and then they had it enough times and yeah. then they started to yeah. like it. Is that a learned behavior? Mm -hmm. Is that a bacterial behavior? Can you speak more to that? Right. And are you the one that did the beautiful research on this area or one of your colleagues that it came with something with, am I, it's in the back of my mind, right? There was something, uh, cause there was a nice press release. What am I? I did not do any research on this. Oh. <laughs> It was something with the patterns, but let, let's, let's chunk this down. So first of all, the taste receptors, there are absolutely taste receptors in the gut, and they, um, but they're not connected to the brain for perception, but they are connected to different parts of the brain and this communication between the gut and the brain. Really interesting stuff. And I actually have been, I had to read a lot of this. I'm still a little bit late. I'm just finishing up the uh, chapter for modern nutrition and health and disease. And I had to read a lot of this really cool stuff. So we know they're variable. We believe that the same variability that you would see in response to bitters in the mouth would be in response to bitters in the gut. We, we believe that. And so then the question is the modulation of those receptors with bacteria. Well, 
So let's think about it. The receptor responds because it binds on to a chemical, right? So would that chemical binding be different? Well, let's say um, in the mouth, let's say if you wanted to block bitterness of vegetables, you could add fat, right? So fat doesn't really, that could then potentially block the bitter binding to the receptor. That could be one thing. Or salt does something to respond or affect the bitter and um, binding and the response. So like if you have a bitter thing and you add salt, like if we had somebody to come in the lab and they tasted quinine and then we followed it with salt, then it wouldn't taste, it would get rid of the bitterness right away. So yeah, this, the contents, does would the contents of the gut influence the receptor binding? Probably. And so then the further thing is how do the strains of eating probiotics or prebiotics, you know, the, uh, the food influence that? I think I've given you an example, like there's lots of food science on how to block, block bitter, how to block receptor binding in food. Could it be then the impact to the gut? These are all good questions. And, you know, we don't, you know, it's still, like how much of a change in the gut microbiome do you have do you have with changes in the diet, right? I mean, that's, I mean, you can see that, but you know, that's still a um, challenging area. So yeah, there I'm sure there's communication and there's exploding mm -hmm. research too on this con connection between chemoreceptors throughout the body, both taste and smell. And then, you know, that's those are good questions. Um, so I don't have any answers, but I know that there's a variability. I would start first with the variability uh, within the subject, right? You'd have to understand that first. And then if you were going to compare changes across time with changes in the gut microbiome, that would be a, a probably a 10 year study. <laughs> I would assume <laughs> would be a lot of, a lot of study to do, but it very important. Okay. Yeah, is there any other questions? Oh, this is really good. Does nudging children to eat bitter taste affect their taste preference? <laughs> well, you know, there's just great research on that. Um, so first of all, you actually, uh, I was, I showed a, a thing uh, in the freshman seminar about why we like what we do and why people like, you know, things like um, Marmot, I guess that's the Australian, you know, thing, and durian, the uh, you know, bitter or the stinky fruit in Asian parts of the country, world, and yeah, so it's learning to like something, and the development of preference based on conditioning. So conditioning can happen in utero, based on the consumption of the mom, you know, the mom's diet, can happen in breastfeeding, which then couples the taste, even if it's bitter with the calorie reward, and then development um, with positive learning, conditioning, with exposure, repeated exposure, but all, all, also all kinds of things that encourage the development of uh, a preference for, for vegetables. Exposure, learning about vegetable color, taste textures, growing vegetables, all those things help to condition a preference at an early age. And that's the goal is to condition a preference early and with access to affordable and enjoyable, healthy food too. So yeah, that's an excellent question. So nudging, you don't wanna like um, force a child to eat, but you encourage them to taste and the taste helps to develop that. And there's a beautiful paper, if you're interested in this, that Marion Hetherington, Hetherington did on a biosocial environmental and developmental model of how children learn to eat. So it takes, it goes beyond the developmental to, to really look at the food environment. So it, it's just a beautiful thought piece. Great, great. Yeah, I'm sure there are, uh, uh, you know, more questions, uh, you know, but it is about the time. So we have to, you know, stop here. And thank you so much, Valerie, for, for the thank wonderful you. and inspiring presentation. Thank you so much. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye-bye.